It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, New York sports fans. I'm Stacey Gotsoulias. I'm a writer at Baseball Prospectus, and I'm the host of the Locked On Yankees podcast. Spring has sprung and baseball is in the air. So if you enjoy analysis, commentary, and opinions on all things Bronx Bombers, give us a listen over at Locked On Yankees. You can find us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Let's go Yankees! Here's the Bills' latest pick. With the ninth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select Ed Oliver, defensive tackle, Houston. Josh Allen, quarterback, Wyoming. Tredavious White, defensive back, LSU. Jermaine Edmonds, linebacker, Virginia Tech. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I am your host of Locked On Bills. It's Tuesday, which means we're back in the rhythm of Twitter Tuesday. This is my favorite show of the week. There's no question about it. I love taking the time to talk about exactly what you want me to talk about. And you guys, once again, filled up the Twitter Tuesday episode with outstanding takes, questions, and comments regarding the Buffalo Bills for me to respond to. Remember, you can get your takes, comments, and questions regarding the Buffalo Bills answered on the Tuesday podcast by hitting me up on Twitter at the Joe Marino hashtag Twitter Tuesday. You can also send me an email. My email address is Joe at the draft Either way, I'll get it and I will do my very best to make sure I answer every single one of these that come my way. As long as it's manageable, we've we, we've had some long Tuesdays together, um, and uh, you know we'll keep we'll keep doing this. This is a lot of fun. So let's dig into today's edition. The first one comes from Josh McCarty. He says Isaiah McKenzie, Jason Croom, and Wyatt Teller all got significant playing time in 2018 out of necessity with the lack of talent on the roster. Sitting here today, I think all three are a long shot to make the roster. Agree? I do. I do agree with you to an extent. Let's go one by one. Isaiah McKenzie, I think it's very difficult for him to make this football team. I don't trust him as a ball handler, never have. And I know that he created a spark for the offense last year. His speed, his ability as a gadget player really helped with the spacing, especially after the constipation of the offense was removed when Andre Holmes and Kelvin Benjamin were no longer part of the mix. But with John Brown and Cole Beasley and probably more importantly, Andre Roberts added to the mix, who's really going to pro- – not probably. He's going to claim that return guy spot. And McKinsey, his value first is probably as a returner, second as a slot receiver. I don't see a course. I don't see a course for him making this football team. Jason Kroom. Man, this tight end situation just got really interesting, as we talked about on yesterday's podcast with the addition of Lee Smith. Now, that did mean Jake Fisher got released right away because, as I tweeted out, I kind of liked what I what I tweeted. I said, you know, the Bills signed Jake Fisher in hopes that he would become a Lee Smith caliber blocker. Well, when you sign Lee Smith, you guarantee that you get a Lee Smith caliber blocker, and you know Jake Fisher was expendable. And I think that was more about a respect for Fisher to say, hey, look, we got what we need here. And we're going to let you go right now. That way you can find another team that's going to be willing to invest in you and give you a chance to transition to tight end. Uh, but now Jason Kroom specifically, you know, look, Dawson Knox is a third-round pick. He's making the team. Lee Smith, a three-year deal, guaranteed money into year two. He's probably going to make this team. Tyler Croft was the big prize tight end free agent that they signed. I think there's your three tight ends that are certainly going to make the team. Then you still have Tommy Sweeney to factor into the mix. Well, where does, J- where does Jason Kroom fit in? I've talked about, I've kind of hinted at this a few times, but I feel like Jason Kroom's best course may be to play at play receiver. That's where he played in, in, in college, and he can give the Bills that size dynamic that they don't have. And so I know Duke Williams is kind of in that mix as a size receiver, maybe David Sills, but Jason Kroom's best asset may be providing that size receiver. So his versatility and his athletic ability – is going to give him a chance, but he's going to have to embrace those because I think he's got an uphill climb here to make this roster. Wyatt Teller, 
I know that he's a fan favorite. He's a, one of my favorites. I, I scouted him, graded him pretty high. Liked that he got a chance to play last year, and, and you know he wasn't awful. But the reality is the Bills signed a ton of veteran guards. And I've mentioned this a few times. I think that's a loud and clear message to not only Wyatt Tuller, but Deion Dawkins that get it together. You're, nothing's going to be handed to you. You're going to have to prove it. And so if Wyatt Tuller is going to make this football team, he's going to have to beat out you know, Spencer Long and Quentin Spain and John Feliciano. Obviously, Mitch Morse is part of this football team. So it's not a given. And especially what's concerning about Wyatt Teller is he's a guard only. I have no idea if he can play center. And so not having that versatility as a guy in competing for a roster spot on the interior offensive line, that's something that could sway the coaching staff in another direction. Now, he has practice squad eligibility. That's a that's a potential landing spot for him. But, you know, look, I, I would have to think that a guy with his kind of pedigree and the experience he had last year that a team would sign him. So that's going to be a curious situation. When I kind of keep going back to when I think about all these roster battles that are, are upon us here as we enter the summer months and, and the, you know, everything gets sorted out, is that there's going to be injuries and the Bills are in good shape to withstand them. So let's keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to uh, – yeah, I got some all right there. Yes, so there, th- those three guys, that's my thoughts on their course to the roster. Um, Dave Russell says, Joe, how do you compare Quentin Spain and John Miller? No one expected the Bills to re-sign Miller, but he got decent money from Cincinnati while Spain settled for a one-year deal. Does their compensation match their relative skill? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Spain, 27 years old. He signed a one-year $2 million deal with the Bills. John Miller, 25 years old, signed a three-year $16.5 million contract with the Bengals. That is basically, you know, he'll be on the team for two years. The way that deal is structured, he'll be on the team at least two years. So the NFL's market for John Miller far greater than than Quentin Spain's market. And I think, you know, I think Spain probably, it's funny, this is tough to answer because I feel like in a lot of ways their strengths and weaknesses are the same except for Quentin Spain started off his career grading very high as a run blocker, and then he the last few years he's been graded poorly as a run blocker but highly as a, a pass blocker, and, and, and John Miller's kind of average in both regards. Maybe there's a ceiling difference. You know, he's, he's two years younger. You know, John Miller's a third-round pick. Quentin Spain was undrafted. I think when I, when I, if I feel like if either player reaches their full potential, I like what – I like what Spain offers in terms of being a nasty run blocker, even though he didn't grade highly for PFF. And I think what that stems from is injuries on that Tennessee offensive line and, and shifts in scheme like crazy. Their their philosophies changed literally the last three years regarding what their offensive scheme was, just really different every year. And I think that really messed up Quentin Spain. So I, I think you've got a good point here, Dave. And, you know, I don't want to be a homer and say, oh, well, you know, Quentin Spain's a better player because clearly when you compare contracts, John Miller was much more valued by the league. But I don't think, you know, the Bills know John Miller. They, geez, McDermott's been around him. They know how he's wired. And obviously they, they didn't feel comfortable coming anywhere near that contract for him. And so best of luck elsewhere. Um, but you know, Spain's Spain's the the guy on a one year deal and a an approve it deal that I expect to have a good season for the Bills this year. Lackawanna Chuck he says, can you give us a typical range of guys who make the roster for each position group? Um, example: five to six wide receivers, four to five running backs. So I I went through and I wrote down those ranges, and here's what I got: quarterback two to three, running back three to five. That's including a fullback. Wide receiver five to seven, tight end three to four, offensive line eight, maybe ten, uh, defensive tackle four or five, defensive end four or five, linebacker five to seven, cornerback four to six, safety four to five, one kicker, one punter, one long one long snapper. If you add up all of those, the high the high range that I gave that equals fifty eight, which is that's too many players. So. You can't go heavy everywhere. <laughs> so that's one thing that we'll have to see what the Bills do, how they prioritize certain spots. 
where the true special teams contributors are going to be. That's where you're going to go heavy. Uh, the good thing is the Bills have some versatility in the secondary, which could help them uh, with some of those numbers there. But um, that's kind of what I thought the ranges would be when I think about any given roster. Um, and then, you know, look, and we'll keep talking about this, but injuries will certainly dictate uh, how things unfold. Daniel Michalak says, first, congrats and welcome back. Thank you. I had a great time on my honeymoon, and it's good to be back. What is your starting offensive line prediction, and how will it determine our offensive identity? Oh, I was hoping somebody would never ask me that because I'm definitely not ready to answer that question, but I'm going to do it. All right, so this is like a gun-to-head thing. Don't get mad at me, but if I had to predict what I think the offensive line will be week one, this is what I got for you. Left tackle, Ty Insecki. Left guard, Quentin Spain. Center, Mitch Morse. Right guard, Spencer Long. Right tackle, Cody Ford. I know it sounds crazy. Deion Dawkins isn't in the mix. But I'll tell you this. I've talked to some people around the Bills that are that are, that are very close. And this was earlier this offseason, before the Bills went on this spree of signing all these free agent offensive linemen. They, they kind of gave me this feel that they, they weren't, nobody's really happy with Deion Dawkins. And they shouldn't be. He wasn't the player he needed to be last year. And he himself admitted that. So I think there's a loud message sent to Deion Dawkins. And he's going to have to be better. He's going to have to be decidedly better than Ty Insecki to win that left tackle job. We know he can't play right tackle. It, it, ugliest thing I've ever seen when he had to get reps at right tackle in preseason. I don't think it's part of what he can do. Can he play guard? Maybe. But I just feel like right now the guy with the inside track to that left tackle job is Ty Insecki. We'll see. That's my prediction. What does it mean for the offensive identity? If you look at those names, those are some big-bodied people that can move people. You heard the Bills talk about this. They want guys with an edge. They want people that are going to move bodies and make sure there's space available for those running backs to work. And obviously pass protection, making sure Josh Allen has the time to unleash that uh, that cannon of an arm he has. So I think the identity of this football team is going to be, hey, we're gonna, we want to be able to run the ball because we can move bodies because, because we have an offensive line that has an edge about them. Matt says, hope you had a great wedding and honeymoon. I did, thank you. Anyway, thoughts on cutting DeMarco and having Jake Fisher being a tight end fullback combo, if that's even a thing. Now, uh, credit to Matt. He sent that in on May 10th, so that was before Jake Fisher was released. But I think you have a good point here, a good kind of a suggestive question here. This tight end fullback thing is probably something that may need to happen because you you think about this tight end room and you kind of want to keep four of them. And you think about this running back situation, and you know you've got <laughs> you've got to me who are you cutting Gore McCoy, Singletary, and and T.J. Yeldon, who you signed on a two year deal. That's four running backs right there, plus Demarco, plus Patrick, or excuse me, Cena Rice Perry, who's a special teams guy. So can you figure a spot to have a, a dual tight end type player that? can also give you those lead blocking things out of the backfield. Well, we saw Patrick DeMarco's role really diminish in the offense, and so he's going to have to really prove himself on special teams to make him worthwhile. Now, I know there's a leadership component with Patrick DeMarco. He's a process guy, all that type of stuff, but at the end of the day, this becomes a math problem, right? And you got to have the right right, uh, numbers at each position and, and certainly have the right mix of players, but... You can only keep so many guys. And so how do you create those niche positions with rosterable players that help you in multiple ways? That's the challenge ahead for this coaching staff. And so I think, you know, it's obviously not going to be Jake Fisher, but can there be a guy that can do multiple things, including giving that fullback role in addition to maybe being a tight end, in addition to maybe being a running back, special teams? Maybe that is Patrick DeMarco. But I think there will be some creativity, whether that's in that spot or others, to get the right mix of guys. Be fun to watch that all unfold. Brad says, with the offseason in full swing, in your opinion, how much of an upgrade is Ed Oliver over Kyle Williams? Also, what kind of impact does Anderson's retirement have on Josh Allen's development? 
Um, I've said this a few times, and I'm surprised I haven't gotten much backlash, but I think I think it's it's just kind of true, but nobody wants to talk about it. I think Ed Oliver on the field is a major upgrade over Kyle Williams, the Kyle Williams that we saw for the last two years. I love Kyle Williams. I, he's one of my favorite Buffalo Bills of all time. But you cannot honestly say that Kyle Williams over the last two seasons was uh, anything like the Kyle Williams we saw in previous years. You know, he wasn't as consistent with his run fits. There were times where he freelanced a bit as a pass rusher and opened up some rush lanes for the quarterback. He just wasn't that same dude. And Oliver is is young, explosive. He's going to be in the backfield. And so I think from a skill perspective on the field, just from that side of things, Oliver is an upgrade. Now, there is a piece of Kyle Williams that nobody will ever replace. His leadership and his ability to motivate others and be accountable and set a standard every single day. None of that stuff's ever going to be replicated. And so I don't know how to quantify that and, and compare that to what I think is a more dynamic football player. But I think in terms of that, in terms of having a, a more potent playmaker, I think the Bills have that in that Oliver, and that's what makes me really exciting because based on what I just said, Sean McDermott has not had that dynamic interior penetrator at three technique until Ed Oliver became part of the mix. So, yes, upgrade on the field in terms of that potential, but I cannot tell you how big of a loss Kyle Williams is to the overall makeup of the football team, the defense, all the important stuff that really matters as well. Derek Anderson's retirement on Josh Allen's development, I don't think it doesn't matter. I talked to them about this a little bit yesterday that this was a priority for, for the Bills was to bring back Derek Anderson and make sure he was part of this quarterback room along with Josh Allen next year. And they saw firsthand what he meant to Josh Allen and everything that that, that has been said up until his retirement about how valuable he was. We're not just going to throw that out the door now because Derek Anderson retired. Now, I know that the Bills are going to feed us lines about, oh, we have a lot of confidence in Matt Barkley and obviously Ken Dorsey being a former player and being the quarterback coach that's really going to help. But <laughs> let's, let's, let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not pretend like all the other things that have been said over the last four months weren't said and that they don't matter. So – I think that it is it is something that that is not ideal. I think they wanted him to be part of that mix, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that it doesn't matter at all. Um, it, there, it's it's logical to say that Ken Dorsey being the quarterback coach, a former player, all that type of stuff that it helps ease that a bit, and certainly Matt Barkley being part of the mix eases that a bit. But all of that stuff was true with Derek Anderson as part of the mix. Derek Anderson's retirement is something that. I'm not going to take lightly in terms of what that meant for Josh Allen and his development. All right, let's see here. Tony Barton says, any chance we release Star Latoulay and trade for McCoy, uh, Gerald McCoy? Um, I'm not sure those are hand-in-hand things. So let's, let's, let's address this. Could the Bills trade for LaShawn McCoy? Yes, I think that's possible, even with Star Latoulay being part of the mix, even with Ed Oliver being part of the mix. I don't think that the Bills are going to release Star Latoulay. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, it's not favorable from a cap position. And I think that Star Latoulay, while he doesn't give you the sexy tackle numbers or the sack numbers or anything like that, I think that he fits his role. He fits that 1-11th of the defense with consistency that Sean McDermott's looking for. His presence in the middle of the defense makes the linebackers better because he's going to occupy space and take up blockers and keep the second level clean. He's going to be consistent. He's one of the few players that is always in the facility. People that I talk to that are around the building all the time, they always talk about how Star Latoulay is that worker, that leader by the example, the process guy that's always around. Star Latoulay isn't going anywhere. He's going to be part of this mix. So, I think that it, he, you know, look the the salary cap that the salary that he carries and all that type of stuff really kind of alters the expectations for him. But I think he's doing exactly what the Bills gave him that fifty million dollar contract to do. He's doing it now. Gerald McCoy, bring him in. <laughs> Heck yeah, man! You aren't going to get any resistance from me on that. I like Gerald McCoy, uh, especially considering you probably don't have to give up much to get him. 
and he's got a, a very favorable contract that can be you know literally taken off the books at any time you want to cut him. So you're not going to find any resistance for me about going after Gerald McCoy. Tim Watson says, of all the players the Bills drafted, how many were part of the 30 pre-draft visits? All right, so I did my my research on this, and if I if I have an accurate tracker and I and I've reconciled the many that exists on the internet, Dawson Knox, Vashawn Joseph, and Ed Oliver were the three top 30 visits that the Bills drafted um, as part of their 2019 uh, draft hall. So. Um, it's actually more. I think that's more than in previous years. So different philosophy for the Bills this year with the draft overall. A lot of underclassmen, not as many senior bowlers. So, you know, just wasn't wasn't consistent stylistically from what we saw the previous two years. Uh, Contavious says, with the team not ex- exercising the fifth-year option on Shaq Lawson, do you think they're looking to trade him? Does it make it? Does it make any sense for a trade not having that fifth year option in place? For example, the Watkins trade. Um, I don't think it necessarily means that. I don't. I, it wouldn't surprise me to see the Bills trade Shaq Lawson. Not at all. That would not surprise me. However, I don't think not exercising the fifth year option is a direct indication of that being true. I think what this comes down to, even though I talked about this a little bit yesterday on the show, I, I, I think it's bad business to pay Shaq Lawson $10 million next year, even though there's plenty of cap space, but there's there's been no indication outside of some pretty good run defense last year that warrants a $10 million cap figure for Shaq Lawson. Now, I probably would have done it because it's not my money, and I want to make sure that I have depth at that spot, and at least I know he can be a run defender. And there's a ceiling there, and hopefully the best version of Shaq Lawson comes onto the field this year for the Bills. But I think this I, – I just don't know that that's a one-for-one one in terms of what that means. Um, does it make it easier for them to trade him – Potentially, I mean, some some team may want to have that control next year because you know it's it's only guaranteed for injury, and so it's it's a pretty easy to get out of. You saw it with Kevin Johnson, the Bills cornerback that they signed from Houston. They picked up the fifth year option, and then they cut him, and it's a clean slate. So uh, that's kind of why I wanted the Bills to pick that up, but I, I, I get it from hey, that's just not great business. Um, this one comes from Topher. He says, you've talked a lot about the depth of the Bills team this year. Could you explain? You gave me two things here. One, what happens to the players that don't make the 53-man roster? Detailing the practice roster and those that don't make the practice roster. Is there a way to hold onto the players that don't make the 53? Good question. I think this is fun. These are the types of questions we're answering right now because people feel good about this roster. And that's a good, that's a good feeling. Um, Again, there's going to be things that are going to happen throughout the course of the next few months that's going to make us very happy that this this team has so many roster-worthy players. But the reality is, outside of the practice squad, there's no way to hold them. Um, that's that's the reality of it. I mean, you could you could put a, a guy on IR that you know designate them for return, but there's only so many slots to do that. So it's practice squad, it's IR, or you got to keep them on the roster. If you put them on that practice squad, remember. They can get plucked, so it's a risky business with that. Uh, second thing Topher said is at some point, can you do a show to project the 53, focusing on the role starter backup special teams each man will have on the Bills? Yep, absolutely. We're going to shift gears to that that for the foreseeable – well, not the foreseeable future, but we're going to talk about that a lot here, and we'll, we'll get the initial look at that coming up here in the next couple of weeks and, and certainly kind of going back through and, and combing through this roster, talking about every every position group and – those types of things. So you can expect that to to definitely be a big part of what we talk about here in the coming weeks as we kind of hit the uh, the lull here in the offseason. Um, Bryce Clark says, hey, Joe, love listening to the pod. Thank you, Bryce. Do you think that the Bills mainly passed on edge rusher in this year's draft due to next year's draft having a fairly strong edge rusher group? I like next year's class, and it looks to have a better overall talent coming out in the first round. Your thoughts? Um, you know, I, I think that's an interesting point, Bryce. I just don't know how much consideration teams give to those types of things. Now, the one thing that I can 
speak to from experience is having been at all the press conferences at the combine this past year, it seemed like every single general manager and head coach that drafted a, a quarterback in the first round in 2018, they were specifically asked, well, did you draft that player knowing that the, the quarterback class this year is weaker? And every single one of them were like, no, we, we liked the player. We liked Lamar Jackson or we liked Sam Darnold or we liked Josh Allen or whatever quarterback they were talking about. So I don't know how much consideration that is given. I don't know why the Bills didn't do more to address the edge rusher spot this year other than they believe probably a lot in Trent Murphy. They like what they have in Jerry Hughes. Maybe Jerry Hughes is resigned. I mean, there, there's a plan. I, I don't think I don't think Brandon Bean's just like, oh, we're good enough there and, and not doing anything. Uh, you know, I, maybe there's something coming. But I, I don't know that I could say – that the Bills were thinking about the 2020 class of edge rushers when considering to not invest in the 2019 group of edge rushers, which was a really, really good group. So um, that's that's my thoughts there. I don't, I don't know that they were thinking about that. A couple more here. Kincaid Upstill says, thoughts on adding another pass rusher, Shane Ray or Nick Perry or dot, dot, dot. Heck yeah. <laughs> I want edge rusher on top of edge rusher on top of edge rusher. I want to send waves of dudes that can get that can beat blocks and get after the quarterback. I don't want any quarterback comfortable. I want other teams to think about playing the Bills and being afraid of that pass rush and figuring out how they're going to max protect to to be able to keep their quarterback upright. I want dudes that can beat blocks. And so if that's Shane Ray or that's Nick Perry, Give it to me. Give it to me. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how impactful either one of those guys are going to be. I don't think you're going to hear, you know, many people speak very highly about them from their former places, but each player is flash and had productive moments. But I, you know, you you guys know what I think about this current Bills defensive end situation. I, I, I'm not, I'm not all that impressed. So adding more to the mix. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm here for that. Last one here comes from Mike Hans. Um, he says, I'm sure you get a bunch of these, but what's the most you would be comfortable the Bills giving up for Jadavion Clowney? Personally, I would give up next year's first round pick. Ooh, this is tough. Why why <sighs> a one, huh? I guess you 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 Take players in the first round hoping that you get an impact player like Jadavion Clowney. I like the way the Bills draft, though. You're going to have to pay Jadavion Clowney a ton of money. I mean, like a $100 million contract. So if you trade that first round pick, you're also going to be committing a long-term deal to him. You know, he's going to want the money Frank Clark got. So for the reason, for this reason, I wouldn't do it. Not because I, <laughs> I know I just talked about how I want waves on tops of the waves of pass rushers and all that type of stuff. For me, it's, it's the combination of giving up the draft pick, but also that you would have to commit that money to him. And I don't know that you just can't sign him next year. So what if I told you that you can make a big run at him, give him that contract, and still keep your first-round pick? I wouldn't give up my first-round pick just so that I can have him in 2019. I think that's what that comes down for me, and I hope that makes sense. I just, I just feel like that's a lot. That's a lot to give up. I don't think, I don't think the, I don't think that Houston's gonna play this game next season. I think he's probably, I mean, maybe they will trade him, but at the end of the day, he could just walk. And, you know, look, I, I mean, if the Bills were going to trade for a pass rusher, do, do what San Francisco did with D Ford. What did they give up, a 2020 second round pick? I, I'd rather do that. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I want to give up that one and give, all, give him all that money when I might not have to. So that's that's my thoughts on that situation. 
Hope you guys enjoyed this. I certainly did. Love working through these questions. Get them in. Get them in for next week. Again, at the Joe Marino on Twitter. Hashtag Twitter Tuesday. Again, the email address is Joe at the Draft Network dot com. Please kindly ask you to subscribe, rate, review, and share the podcast. Tomorrow is Water Cooler Wednesday, and I like I like the direction of that show. We're going to have some fun with that on Wednesday, bringing in a guest, maybe not a Bill specific guest but one that can talk intelligently about the Bills and maybe a division rival. So look forward to that. Make sure you don't miss it. Hit that subscribe button. I'll talk to you guys again tomorrow. Thanks for listening to today's Locked On Podcast. want to remind you, your smart speaker can play a Locked On Podcast. Just tell your smart speaker, play podcast and the name of your podcast. I could show you exactly how right now, But then Alexa or Google's likely to do it. So I'll just explain. Say, whoever you're talking to, or whatever you're talking to, play podcast Locked On Blank. Have a great day.